Hello, welcome to The Rest is History. For more than 200 episodes, we've covered everything from the foundations of ancient Babylon to the origins of the war in Ukraine. But no topic has excited more interest, enthusiasm and curiosity among the great British public than today's. One of the truly great questions of history. What has been the importance, the influence and the impact of the pigeon? Tom Holland. <laughs> I'm so I'm so excited about this episode. You know, I I think it was January, was it? I raised it. Um, yeah, it I, seems I, I suggested like, doing it. Seems like years ago, frankly, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dominic. So you, I think it's fair to say, have treated initially this subject with levity. You you did not regard it as a fit subject for historical inquiry. That is an outrageous claim, Tom, and one I absolutely reject. <laughs> I, well. <laughs> Dominic, I, I have the, I don't actually have the evidence to prove it. You have it. the documentary I, evidence to prove it. I, I'm sure there are the old tweet or something out there with you sneering at it as a subject. No, but, no. But, but we have both agreed, haven't we, that actually the relationship of humans to animals, to creatures is a really fascinating one. So we've talked about doing um, horses, yeah. dogs. And, and dogs, of course, have been a, con were a constant theme of our early episodes. Yes. Dogs were all killed, weren't they? Yes. I haven't I mean, had a dead dog for a while, which is a shame. <laughs> but today we're going to have dead pigeons. And so yes. the reason I thought that actually, um, together with horses and dogs, pigeons are probably um, the most interesting animals to look at as, in terms of how humans have understood them, the uses that humans have put them to, yeah. and also a, a kind of perhaps the, the darkest theme of all, um, the, the way in which humans have um, Im impacted and eaten them. Yeah. Well, have, have, have shot and wiped them out as well. Yeah. So extinction is also a part of the history of humanity's relationship to animals. And However, Tom so the reason why I thought we should do pigeons. Yeah. Is because I went to an advent service um, last year and there I found myself sitting next to Gordon Carrera, um, the BBC security correspondent, author of, many fa fantastic books on yep. history of security services, all that kind of stuff, presenter of TV programs on MI5, all that kind of stuff. But he told me that he had written a book, which I had missed, called Operation Columba, The Secret Pigeon Service, the yes. untold story of World War II resistance in Europe that, as its name suggests, has pigeons absolutely at its heart. And Gordon said, you must do yep. pigeons. So Gordon, the time has come. We are doing pigeons. <laughs> Should we welcome you with a sort of a pigeon style coup or something? Ooh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> the well, dove thank from you. above. The d <laughs> I've never been called that before. <laughs> I'm so grateful for coming on because um, I'm very excited about pigeons. I did sense that there might be some people out there who might think it wasn't a, a worthy subject for such a lofty high-minded podcast. So I'm looking forward for the chance to kind of make the case for pigeons it, in my mind as the superheroes of history. Oh, that's a big claim. I like to talk. Who sa saved us in the past and may even save us in the future. That's, that's the claim I'm going to make. So maybe you could start off. I mean, I notoriously know nothing and take no interest in science or the natural world at all. So for an absolute ignoramus like me, what is a pigeon? Good question to start with. The first thing to say is that, that what we call a pigeon uh, and what we think of as a pigeon around us is actually a dove. And basically, doves have good PR, pigeons have bad PR. Uh, but the pigeon, the, the one we think of, is the rock dove. Uh, and there are other types uh, of pigeons as well, and we might come to some of those, the kind of um, passenger pigeon and, you know, the wood pigeon and different types. But Columba Livia is the kind of famous pigeon and um what's the, the name what makes it really interesting and unusual is uh is that it's very friendly with people so first of all uh rock dove because it uh doesn't so much nest in trees but it loves rocky ledges so originally cliffs but the fact that it was um happy in cliffs meant it was quite happy on rocky ledges. So people found that they could um, build um, what became dovecots, you know, uh, places where pigeons would quite happily come and live. And also, eventually, you get plenty of rocky ledges in cities. So that's why we see so many in the cities. They're, they're, they're intrinsically happy in a kind of human environment. They're also very friendly with people. Um, they're not scared of us. You don't need to cage them. They'll come and eat out of your hand. And that means they're easy to domesticate. So right from the earliest days of history, it's meant they've been able to have this very interesting relationship with humans um, because they, 
that they, they're friendly with us. They can be bred very easily for whatever reason, ranging from food to sport to their superpower, which hopefully we'll come to in a bit. So, so Gordon, before we come on to that, the superpower and the uses that, that pigeons have been put to by humans, could we, you talked about how humanity's relationship with the pigeon is very, very ancient. Could we just begin by looking at the, dare I say, sacral oh, <laughs> quality that the pigeon has had? Well, because, because they are absolutely woven into um, some of the foundational mythologies. So the Bible, most obviously. So I guess probably the most famous um, episode in myth that um, pigeons have featured in is Noah and his ark. That's right. And uh, if the story, of course, is that the birds are sent out and the raven is sent out and doesn't come back and the pigeon comes back with word that there's land. Um, it, it's one example uh, of where, uh, one of the few examples where Game of Thrones is historically inaccurate because, of course, in Game of Thrones, they use ravens to communicate. In reality, it was pigeons which would get, it was pigeons that get sent out. And if you look at the, you know, Noah's Ark, it's the raven fails, but the, the pigeon, the dove succeeds and brings back news. And it's the association of pigeons with peace and chastity, which comes very early. And this comes from people actually observing the mating rituals of the pigeons and how one of the reasons is just how affectionate they are with each other. And they, um, the, the male pigeon really will woo the female pigeon very attentively. Um, and uh, then the view from classical times onwards was that they became very chaste. They were, they were very loyal to each other. And so pigeons start to be seen as symbols of um, peace, of chastity, of fidelity, uh, and you see that role as one part of, of their kind of spiritual role in uh, the traditions and in, in many of the religious traditions around the world. You see this in, a, a, in Christianity, you of course see the, the, the dove uh, as the Holy Spirit descending from, a, from above. The Holy Spirit comes down as, as a dove. Uh, you also see them used as animal sacrifices in, in, in religion. But, but Gordon, a very stupid question to again reflect my my natural history ignorance so why are they called doves so no one talks about i mean if somebody said the holy spirit the pigeon of the holy spirit <laughs> i mean that sounds faintly comical yeah, but the dove you know sounds we take it for granted so why why the branding well, well the branding is just unfortunate branding to some extent uh, and i think the pigeon has just had a uh, bad bad pr and uh, you know there are differences and there are different types of doves but I would make the case that in many cases in history where they are talking about doves, yeah. they're really talking about pigeons. Now, that may not so always would, be the So case. your message to the Church of England is, you know... <laughs> Amplify so pigeons. Yeah, big up the pigeons, play down the doves, basically. Yeah, exactly. And, and, they, uh, and it's, they become this symbol of uh, peace as well as chastity. Um, and um, one of the interesting ways that's used is they're, they're kind of released, and we still see them released. You see the kind of doves or white pigeons released, um, famously at Olympic uh, ceremonies. And uh, this happens in ancient times. Uh, it's revived in the modern Olympics. Um, uh, one of the slight tragedies, though, comes in the Seoul Olympics in 1988. They and flew you, into the flame, didn't they? Uh, I'm afraid <laughs> so. Right? They, they didn't oh. fly home, but they, they just settled on the nearest rocky ledge, which unfortunately was the Olympic flame, which then got turned on and then grilled the pigeons. So, so essentially in antiquity, there, there are the two themes. There's the, the homing pigeon, so as mm -hmm. in Noah, sending the dove out and it comes back. And then there's this idea of it being monogamous, of being a, a symbol of, of of lifelong chastity and love. Um, and you can see that both of those, I guess, would, you know, I mean, there's there's lots of potential there for myth making. Yeah. Uh, and and you see it, uh, you see it in uh, Egyptian mythology, in um, in Greek mythology, you see it in, in, in the major modern religious traditions, all of them will use uh, pigeons in different ways. So uh, sometimes associated as well with fertility, again, because of their kind of, uh, the, the, the way they're bred, and also sometimes a sacrifice. So um, substituted for human sacrifice, sometimes they will, they will sacrifice pigeons almost precisely because they're seen as pure. Um, and, and so it's making this great sacrifice to kill a pigeon. Can I, could I just mention two of my favorite classical writers? Here we go. We only knew this was coming. Okay, so first Herodotus, first great, historian greek historian 
I don't know if you come across this, Gordon. There's um, a story he said, Herodotus says, that there were two black doves were sent flying from Thebes in Egypt. And one of them flew to uh, Siwa, which would become the great oracle of Ammon that Alexander the Great went to, of course, Dominic. Uh, of course. And the other flew to Greece and to Dodona, which became the great oracle of Zeus in, uh, in northern Greece. And Herodotus has a theory that these were not actually doves. That, but they were they were priestesses who'd been kidnapped as slaves and taken away. Uh, and he says the reason for this is to people in uh, Libya and in Greece, the barbarous language of these Egyptian priestesses must have sounded like doves. And he says, how else to explain the obvious impossibility of a talking dove? Which is, <laughs> you know, the Sandbrookian tone of scepticism right in the very beginnings of history. Um, the claim of the Dodonians that the dove was black surely signifies that the woman was an Egyptian. So mm. there's Herodotus getting to work on doves. And the other, my other favorite um, classical writer is Pliny the Elder, who, you know, in his natural history, he's looking at the, the totality of creation and animals are a crucial part of it. And he loves pigeons. And there's loads of great stuff about pigeons. So he um, uh, he says that they would pigeons live to be 30 and sometimes 40. Is that true? I don't know if yeah. that's true. Um, he says that pigeons always lay a male and a female egg. The male egg is laid first, then the female egg a day later. That pigeons mm. um, become great pals with peacocks, which I think <laughs> is they? a lovely idea. Is that, is that right? I, Again, I don't know. Is that I'm true? not entirely <laughs> sure about all of these. <laughs> um, and then, and then his, I think his most clinching I mean, his most fascinating point, human teeth contain a kind of poison, Pliny writes, for if you bear your teeth in front of a mirror, you will dim its brightness. Similarly, if you bear your teeth at a baby pigeon, you will kill it. I, oh. I think those things are both just lies, <laughs> aren't they? <laughs> Isn't that the... <laughs> well, I don't think they're lies. I, think possi I mean, possibly not entirely inaccurate. But also, uh, Gordon, and coming now to the uses that humans have put pigeons to, which I know is your great theme, um, Pliny talks about... Um, the fascination that people in Rome have with homing pigeons. Mm. And he says that they become incredibly valuable. And he talks about how in 50, around 50 BC, um, a single pair of pigeons are sold for 400 denarii, which is about twice the annual pay that a legionary is getting. Hmm. Um, so Crikey. you're starting to see there that these, these, these birds can be incredibly valuable in civilizations and cultures where mm. there is a kind of proper understanding of their homing abilities. So can we come to the homing ability? The, the way I always think about it, it really is a superpower, you know, because these are creatures which, like a kind of superhero, they kind of live among us and look normal, and you don't realise that they have this tremendous power. We uh, still don't um, really understand it, is that right? And, I mean, and like any true kind of a superhero story, the science behind it is a bit wobbly. I mean, no one knows how it works. But eff effectively, if you imagine, if you were taken, uh, you know, blindfolded and put in the boot of a car and driven 500 miles away and then suddenly let out in a field and told, yeah. find your way home without a map, without a phone or anything, you'd be lost. You would have no idea where you were. A pigeon, you can do that. You could take a pigeon you know, put it in a container, drive it to somewhere it has never been before, release it, open up the container, and it will orient itself and just zoom home as fast as it can. How, how, what's, its, what's its range, Gordon? Its range is, is, is hundreds of miles. And the trick is with breeding that you can yeah. breed them to go even further and faster. And the the definitely cases of at least 600 miles. Um, 600 miles? 600 miles. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? And the science behind it is still a bit of a mystery. It is a bit like they have an internal GPS in mm. their head, which allows them to kind of geolocate themselves, you know, perhaps to do with the sun, perhaps to do with the Earth's magnetic field, and and say, I am here, and that way is home. Um, and, just, and just fly home. Uh, and, and through selective breeding, which is the other aspect of that domestication, which, which makes it possible to do selective breeding so well with, with pigeon, pigeons, you can improve that ability and train it. And the simple reason is pigeons, again, it goes to that kind of warm thing about pigeons. They just love home. They just love food and they love home. And all they want to do is get home because that's where food is. And so all they can think about when they're like released Dominic. is, how do, how do I get home? <laughs> Tom, I'm the pigeon of the rest of this history. Is that what you're saying? Uh, that people realise that this is a tremendously useful power. You know, it's incredibly, right. incredibly so, valuable. So Noah recognises this. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's a Greek poet called Anacreon who kind of uses the, the dove as a metaphor for um, 
the messages that he wants to send to his beloved and then the beloved will send messages back. So that's all fine. But with Pliny, you're starting to get this idea that this might actually, I, do, I mean, I don't know what he's, is it a sport that he's writing about or is it, does it have military potential? Because this is the kind of, in your book, this is the the, the, the kind of, the key use that it's put to is, is it in war and in intelligence gathering. And so the, the earliest use we know about it is about uh, at least kind of 5,000 years ago. The Egyptians would use it to warn about flooding. So they'd take them um, up the Nile. And if the Nile was flooding, they'd release them. They'd fly home and, and warn people of that. But then th the first time we start to see the kind of uh, use of it militarily does seem to be that we know of, at least, is around the Roman period. Um, Julius Caesar is thought to use them in Gaul. Um, uh, to send messages between different parts of his army. Um, at the siege of Medina, the Roman general Decimus Brutus sends messages out of the city by carrier pigeon, which results in reinforcements being sent in to kind of break the siege. So you start to see people realising these are, are valuable militarily uh, as well as in everyday life. So as well as, you know, se sending messages about the results of the Olympics, which is thought to happen in classical times, you see this military use. A basic question, Gordon. Uh, I'm a Roman general. I have a pigeon. I want to send him to my lieutenant to ask for reinforcements or whatever. I mean, obviously, I tie the message to the pigeon's yep. leg. The, how, how does the pigeon know where to go? So if I so, say, please go to the, 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 the barracks of the Third Legion or whatever, I mean, how does the pigeon, how have they, they must have obviously done something, but what have they done? So, so all the pigeon will know is it goes to its home. I mean, in modern terms, a loft, but a, a home, the home where it, as, which it associates with its food. Right. So the trick is, if you're training these pigeons, you slowly release them further and further away, but always have the food there for them to return to. And then you slowly can extend the range, but it will always associate that one home as food. So it's difficult. So what's hard is it's hard to use them in a very mobile way because they will always tend to go back to the same place. Right. If they're on campaign, you don't want the pigeon to go back to Rome. Yeah. No, but you can start training them from very young. So within a within a couple of months, you can have a you you could have one which is flying home. See, right, it's, right, right, right. So so you could have a kind of headquarters or a base uh, to which they will fly and and know that and then use that as your form of communication. So um, that kind of military use comes in then and then you you see it right through through history i mean that this use um for kind of pigeon post uh and it's not just in the the, the western world you see it in china uh, there's a very active pigeon post between i think baghdad and cairo in the 12th century um genghis khan used pigeons to communicate over those long distances so it's used kind of throughout this period as the kind of one of the standard means of, of communication, effectively. What, one other logistical question. Let's talk about the speed. Mm. So if I'm in Baghdad and I want to send a message to Cairo, obviously that's going to take, I know they, they probably have tremendous roads in the Abbasid Caliphate. Tom, you'll know more <laughs> about this than me. You know, obviously the Persians had their, their famous kind of highways and stuff. But um, does the pigeon, can the pigeon, you know, dramatically outpace a team of horsemen or something? Would you say, well, Gordon? 60 miles an hour is a good speed for a, a, a okay. pigeon can do. A, that that a good is pretty pigeon, dramatic. Which is pretty good, you know, yeah. and for a sustained period, you know, for, 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 they don't like to fly at night and they kind of tend to take particular routes, but, you know, you could. But a pigeon you, could fly for six hours? Yeah. At yeah. 60 miles they're an quite, hour? Yep. Yeah, exactly. So they could cover, they, they can cover hundreds of miles in, in a day, in a day's flight. Um, yeah, that's so particularly, you know, you can imagine it's particularly if you're cut off, um, so that you know, if you're in a, in a, if you're in a campaign or you're somewhere which is remote and and the the, the territory between you is, um, you know, held by an opponent or dangerous or difficult, if you can allow a pigeon to take that journey rather than trying to do it on you know horseback or foot, it's much easier. Yeah. So this is something that people are doing throughout history, um, and it carries on into the modern period. So yeah. in modern periods of modern warfare? Yeah, and back to the kind of modern period, if, we, if you hit the 19th century, um, to, to, to Dominic's question about speed, 1850, the birth of the Reuters news agency comes with a pigeon. 
So right. um, Julius Reuters in Belgium flies pigeons to carry news and stock prices between Brussels and Germany because it's faster than any other means. So you can see even in that period, um, you know, the telegraph is slowly emerging, but the pigeon is still pretty useful. And that's where kind of Reuters comes from. Uh, you also start to the 19th century, I think, is almost where um, it becomes in the kind of popular consciousness. Before then, it's military commanders. It's often aristocrats who are the aristocracy and breed pigeons often for sport and for show, kind of in India and other, in other places as well. Um, they enter the popular consciousness a bit more in that uh, late 19th century period. The siege of Paris is very important because uh, Paris under siege 1870, a couple of million messages are thought to come out through pigeons. Um, and right. the pigeons are often taken in on uh, on hot air balloons, weirdly, and you know, delivered. Uh, people will fill in their messages, uh, release the pigeons, and they fly out, and it allows people to know uh, what's going on. So that also is a, is a period where you see people understand the kind of value of it, and they become something people are kind of talking about. And pigeon racing starts to emerge as a sport, particularly in yeah. Belgium, but in other countries as well. In that late nineteenth century period. And then you get to the kind of 20th century when they are really important in wartime. Gordon, could I just mention um, on the Discord, uh, which um, we have for the uh, rest of history members, uh, there's a message from Andrew H. who says, I'm a sub-editor at Reuters. So I have to tell you that our founder, Baron Julius Reuter, used pigeons to deliver stock market prices in 1850. So just backing up what you said there. Very good. Also, my favourite historical Reuters sub-editing fact, that there's a spelling mistake on the Baron's grave in West Norwood Cemetery and a small plaque nearby correcting the typo. So that has nothing Ooh. to do with pigeons, but I just thought I'd, I'd mention that because it's a <laughs> sweet fact. So, so we, come to the, we come to the First World War. And I guess the most famous pigeon in the First World War is Speckled Jim. <laughs> <laughs> We've had a number of questions. So for those who haven't seen it, this is Blackadder Goes Forth, um, a comedy show set in the, uh, in the trenches. And Edmund Blackadder, played by Rowan Atkinson, shoots, mm, <laughs> shoots a does. pigeon, which is owned by uh, Stephen Fry, a.k.a. General Melchett who is unbelievably upset by this and gets him uh, sentenced to be shot by a firing squad for it. Um, and we have a question from Michael Taylor. Was shooting pigeons such as Speckled Jim truly a capital offence in the trenches? Well, it, the pigeons were certainly shot and snipers would go after them. Now, whether it was a capital offence in the trenches, I'm not sure. I could imagine quite a few people like Blackadder would have if you're hungry, a pigeon is a very tempting thing, which is what Blackadder yeah. does, unfortunately. Yes, it's a speckled does. Jim, which it turns out is General Melchett's prized, ah! famous, <laughs> favourite pigeon. Um, but, but, uh, but actually, I'm not sure that people would have um, um, shot them so easily because they really did rely on them and they used them in, in the First World War in a fascinating way. And one of my favourite quotes, which I'll just briefly read, which I think if I could read it in a General Melchett, voice I would but it, it's if it became necessarily immediately to discard every line and method of communications used on the front except one and if it were left to me to select that one method I should unhesitatingly choose the pigeons this is Major General Fowler Chief of Signals and Communications in the British Army when the battle rages and everything gives way to barrage and machine gun fire to say nothing of gas attacks and bombings it is to the pigeon that we go for succor there must have been particular heroic pigeons, but oh. is the, am I right in thinking, is the, is the one that stands out for you? Oh, there is for me. This is one of my favourites, Cher Ami. So this is the uh, US Army's 77th Division, um, uh, becomes known as the Lost Battalion. It becomes trapped effectively behind enemy lines uh, in a forest, uh, and then its own side begins to shell it because uh, it, it, they don't know they're there. <laughs> I know. And so they think we've got to get a message out to our own side to say, yeah. uh, to, 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 to stop this. Um, they've got three pigeons. First pigeon, they write a message saying, you know, we're here. Um, stop the shelling. For heaven's sake, stop it. First pigeon, they release into the air, shot by a German sniper. Oh. Second pigeon, another message, released into the air, shot by a German Third pigeon, last pigeon, their last hope, effectively, of su survival. Cher Ami, released into the air, shot, but it flies on. <gasps> Cher Ami 
keeps going despite being terribly wounded, terribly wounded, uh, makes it back to base in about uh, half an hour or so with the message, the shelling stopped and the, the, the lost battalion is saved. And Jeremy is, is lauded as this great pigeon, croix de guerre from, from the war. It loses its leg and is blinded, but survives the journey home and is then, uh, when it dies soon afterwards, stuffed. And you can see it in the Smithsonian Museum in Washington. Oh, I thought you were going to say it gets a kind of military funeral and yeah. buried with full <laughs> yeah. honours. I don't think it'd be stuffed. So there is a, so there is a question from um, Al Akfar who asks, uh, what medals have pigeons received? So you've well, the Croix de Guerre. Yeah, Croix de Guerre. And then in the Second World War, which we can come to, the Dickin Medal, which is, a you know, very important. So, Gordon, I think we should take a break here. Because, Gordon, the Second World War, that really is the kind of the gateway for you, wasn't it, into your yeah. fascination with pigeons? <laughs> That's and my that, gateway drug. Sub- <laughs> your gateway drug. And this, this was the subject of your, your great book, Operation Columba. So let's take a break now. And when we come back, maybe you could tell us the story of Operation Columba. Welcome back to The Rest is History. Uh, the BBC's Gordon Carrera is manfully succeeding in his great enterprise of persuading me and the listening public of the Western world that <laughs> nothing has mattered more in human history than the humble pigeon or, or rock dove, as I, as I learn I should now think of it. So, Gordon, we ended, we had the First World War um, and the tremendous story of Cher Ami, but really your interest it began with the Second World War with Operation Columba, um, and with the because obviously we think of the Second World War as you know radar sub U boats, mm. a very technologically sort of advanced conflict, but pigeons played a, a, an underappreciated role in the Second World War, didn't they? Absolutely, uh, and thousands of them. And uh, one of the interesting things, it was part of the People's War as well, because pigeons had become a big sport. Um, there were about 70,000 pigeon lofts by the time you get to the start of the Second World War, um, homing pigeons who were being used for sport, real part of, of, of working class culture, actually, mm-hmm. at that time. It's really interesting, kind of in partly lost, but not entirely, so it's still there. Um, but you know, it's referred to at the time as the kind of, as the, um, the, the poor man's racehorse. You know, you, if you, you might have wanted to, you know, you might have dreamt of breeding a horse and being able to race it and win some money. Well, you couldn't afford to do that if you're a, if you're a working class, but you could be breed those pigeons in your lot. So it's become a huge sport. And uh, at the start of the, the war, there is this decision to kind of tap into, to this. And it's because of a, a particular intelligence requirement. Uh, Europe has been, occupied, the, the kind of traditional intelligence networks for MI6, for instance, have collapsed at the start of the war. And as a result, um, they're desperate to understand what is going on uh, inside occupied uh, France, the Low Countries, and to get a feel for, for what's happening. And so this intelligence operation is proposed, and it comes out or through a very obscure branch of British intelligence. Um, you've heard of MI5, you've heard of MI6. This is MI14 subsection D, um, which runs the uh, Special Continental Pigeon Service. And they decide that what you can do is drop pigeons effectively randomly um, behind enemy lines um, by flying over it through the RAF who are flying and dropping in special agents. You drop pigeons in um, canisters and attached to the canisters is a note saying, this is a pigeon from Britain. And um, uh, they often put a a copy of a a resistance newspaper, or sometimes the Daily Mail with it to prove it had come from um, Britain. What a a Uh, choice. And a questionnaire. And the questionnaire was, um, what are the Germans doing in your area? Are there, what are the German troop deployments? Um, you know, have they been on the move? What's German morale like? Um, what's the food situation? Even what's the reception of the BBC? Because they were kind of interested in knowing that. A series of kind of questions for people to gather intelligence from ordinary people in occupied Europe. And, and they relied on these uh, pigeons being effectively donated by ordinary uh, pigeon fanciers in 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 Britain who would give their pigeons to um, the army and to MI14D, uh, and who would then drop them um, through the RF and then wait and see what they got back um, uh, on return flights. 
What do they get back? Well, they get back this, you know, and I found this file in the National Archives, which is full of these pink slips. And, and reading them is really powerful because they're just from ordinary people in, in rural France, particularly also Belgium, the Netherlands. And they range from people going, um, you know, not much, not much to see here, but please come and liberate us soon. To, to talk about the food supply, to rich intelligence uh, yeah. about what's going on in their area. Um, there's one particular message which I kind of got obsessed by, which was message 37, which came um, from Belgium and had this amazing amount of detail. And if you imagine, it had to be fitted on, you know, on a, on a, you know, a piece of paper about the size of a large postage stamp, which could then go into a tube and fit around a pigeon's leg. And yet it produced about a dozen pages of intelligence because someone had written in the most tiny way. It was actually a, a Catholic priest who'd uh, learnt calligraphy while a missionary in China uh, to write in huge detail um, intelligence about German deployments and, and where German headquarters were. Uh, and in the archives, uh, you know, this message gets shown to Churchill. And, and Churchill um, is shown that message um, personally. And, you know, in a way, I found that fascinating because Churchill himself wouldn't, you know, he didn't need to know that specific piece of intelligence. You know, that, that's, that's not his job. So why was he shown it? Well, the answer was it, it embodied that spirit of resistance, which Churchill so believed in and so wanted to foster in Europe. And this was a sign that there were people there in occupied Europe who were willing to, t to risk their lives by sending messages back to Britain through a pigeon uh, with intelligence because they wanted to resist. So it was this powerful bond was created through the pigeon um, between Britain and people in occupied Europe, particularly in that early stage of the war. But also, Gordon, presumably because it kind of shows the can-do spirit, the uh, the innovative uh, qualities that Churchill was really into, wasn't it? I mean, he was kind of obsessed with coming up with weird he likes, a, he likes a wheeze, doesn't he? He likes yeah. a wheeze and a clever intelligence operation. And what's interesting is even the kind of scientific bods in uh, British intelligence. So R.V. Jones, who's the famous um, figure I involved in, in, in MI6 and, and the Air Ministry, realises he can use these pigeons. So he um, asks for a question about uh, on this questionnaire about have you seen any kind of strange structures um, with uh, rotating um, um, features. And what he's looking for are German radar stations. And um, uh, because he realises that people will spot um, um, something strange. They won't know what it is, but they're so unusual that, uh, th mm. that they will be able to identify these, these radar stations, which are often hidden in rural locations, which is the kind of places these pigeons uh, normally get dropped. And a number of German radar stations are spotted purely thanks to Operation Columba and then destroyed, which protects RAF planes. And the same actually with V1 and V2 launch sites. Again, you know, these very modern weapons of war are spotted thanks to intelligence, which is brought back through the pigeons. And Gord Gordon, are the Germans doing the same? Are they using pigeons? <laughs> yes. Uh, so they, they actually, in true German style, are far more organised about their pigeon use than the, the kind of slightly haphazard British volunteer operation. But one of the, um, one of the fun stories of the war is, so uh, uh, early on, they, uh, th there's this worry that British Columba pigeons and other pigeons being used in the war are going to be uh, killed by um, peregrine falcons by, um, um, on the coast. Yes. And so they decide that to protect the intelligence coming in from the birds, they're going to have to kill the peregrine falcons. And so MI5 sets up one of the few units I've ever discovered, which does have a license to kill which is the Falcon <laughs> Destruction <laughs> Unit. And its Falcon job, which is unit. the wow, Falcon amazing. Destruction Unit, is five guys who go around in a, a big American Packard car with a, with a caravan on the back and go around the cliffs of Britain killing falcons, basically. And, and their job is to protect the pigeons. Uh, unfortunately, one falls off a cliff to his death. But it, so it's, it's a kind of tragic comic story. But then in, in that piece of kind of absurdity, which could only be kind of the British you know, um, wartime intelligence service, they then suddenly get worried at MI5 that actually the Germans might be sending pigeons out of Britain uh, and that they yeah. might be using pigeons for undercover agents in Britain to send back intelligence to Germany. So they suddenly realise, uh, particularly they, they spot some 
pigeons Nazi flying Nazi pigeons. Fa- Nazi <laughs> pigeons <laughs> flying fast over the Scilly Isles towards 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 Europe. And they're like, Nazi pigeons. We've got to stop them. So in a, how, do you, in a how, do you, how do you identify a Nazi pigeon? Gordon? They've got a swastika. Just to be, just to be yeah. They're doing salutes as they're flying. <laughs> That's a good question. So in one of those fantastic wartime reversals from having a falcon destruction unit, they then decide they need a falcon unit to hunt Nazi pigeons and set one up uh, and uh, get someone who has got a peregrine falcon trained to hunt Nazi pigeons. And, and this team <laughs> from MI5 goes onto the Scilly Isles in the summer and they sit on the golf course of the Scilly Isles with a, with a falcon on their wrist, as you might have seen, ready to hunt yeah. pigeons. And um, they, they, they kill pigeons, but the only pigeons they kill are plucky British pigeons. So they, oh, never, no. find a, they never find a Nazi pigeon? No, not a single Would a Nazi, Nazi pigeon. Uh, there must be some way they could have done a coup or test to see if their coup had got a German accent, a German uh, the, accent in the, pigeon. The, the, no swastikas, you know, on the pigeon, no friend or foe identifier on the pigeon. So, so it's not the most successful wartime operation, it's fair to say, but, 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 you know, um, uh, emblematic of the realities of war. And does, Gordon, does this division of MI5 still exist? <laughs> <laughs> if it we was, wouldn't know, Tom, wouldn't we, Tom? If it was, yeah. Tom. <laughs> B, I think it was uh, B13C uh, of um, <laughs> MI5. It might, it, it might secretly still be going on. It might still, yeah, yeah. But you there, are other, there are other heroic pigeons, aren't there? So there's a pigeon, I believe, called Winky. Ah, yes, Winky's Winky. a great hero of the Second World War. Yeah, because they, they also use them on, on the RF gives pigeons to planes, particularly going over the sea, in case they crash, in case they uh, ditch, um, and the radios don't work or there's a problem. Then you release a pigeon with your coordinates. And Winky is a very famous case because um, the, the the plane tries to radio where it is, it ditches. Winky actually gets free without a message, flies home, but covered in oil from the ditching. And so the loft owner and the RAF work out that this is a pigeon from the plane that ditched. And they work out based on the speed with which it flew, roughly where that plane might be, and then locate the, 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 the plane and save the crew in their dinghy. Um, That's and a then good wink- story. Does Winky get a medal? And Winky is one of those who is, is heavily decorated. And I think he's, he's <laughs> given a big di- di- dinner at the RAF. Um, where he's winking, he's winking, and that's why he's called Winky. But it's the thought right. is he's actually so exhausted still, he's never recovered from his flight. That's why oh. he's, he's I, winking, but he's known as Winky. If I was winky. a pigeon, I'd be very suspicious of being invited to a dinner at an RAF. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't you? I mean, no, would, pigeon I'd, be very ang- I'd want to see the menu before. Speckle <laughs> Jim. Yeah. I'm afraid that's what happens to lots of the Columba pigeons. You know, they're dropped in the French countryside and hungry French French farmers roast them with peas. Oh, that's rather than a pigeon picks up, a, a pigeon pitches up with a copy of the Daily Mail, and the first time the French <laughs> crew is to eat it. <laughs> Confirming all your darker suspicions. Of France, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, so Gordon, um, after the Second World War, do, do pigeons continue to have any role in intelligence, or or not? Well, so after the war, there is this. Again, when I went through the National Archives, the things you find at Kew um, but was a file about the Joint Intelligence Committee subcommittee on pigeons, whose minutes I, I read studiously, in which there is quite a, a serious debate about you know, whether, pigeons, whether a pigeon research capability should be kept. And they look at things, for instance, about whether pigeons have a role in the atomic age. So could they fly through um, yeah, you know, kind of clouds of radioactivity and still, you know, would that affect, affect their ability? Um, the signs are in the in Britain that they stop after the Second World War. But fascinatingly, in the in the US, I was lucky enough. I was interviewing for the BBC, the director of the CIA, a few years ago, and I have a museum uh, in the CIA of of kind of artifacts. And I was fascinated to see one of the artifacts they have is a stuffed pigeon with a tiny camera on its on its chest. Uh, and it turns out what they did was uh, drop these pigeons um, over the Soviet Union or the Eastern Bloc, and the, the camera had a kind of automatic shutter. So it would just snap pictures as it flew back from where it was to its home. 
Um, one of the things, until recently, there was a sign um, uh, when you looked, the, looked this up on the kind of CIA website, it said details of spy pigeon missions are still classified. <laughs> oh, fantastic. That's great. Which, which, uh, which I love. So one kind of issue I, I just wanted to raise as we kind of reach the, the, the modern era, which, which, you know, I know this is a history podcast, but a, a kind of current national security concern that I, that I have, which is, which is what I call the pigeon gap. And Dominic will be familiar about the, the missile gap. The missile gap. <laughs> I've never from, heard from, of the pigeon gap. The, the, which Kennedy obviously campaigned on. I, 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 my concern about the, the pigeon gap came when I read this article that the Chinese People's Liberation Army in recent years was training 10,000 mm. carrier pigeons. And the reason was that they were concerned that um, in the event of some kind of cyber attack, which took out their communications, they could then... Uh, wow! Yeah. Rely on pigeons, and and it got me, yeah. you know, worried and, and wondering, you know, wh whether we are pigeon prepared as a nation, or is there, and is is there a pigeon gap, and and why are we pigeon ready? And uh, uh, well, uh, uh, so you know, I'm fortunate in my position. I've been able to raise this with what you might euphemistically call senior security officials, and, and all I've got when I've raised the pigeon gap are kind of blank stares. You know, blank, you, you blank stare. me, Gordon. The, the, oh, blank the, stares. When, the, when mean, you bring up the issue of pigeons with with our, <laughs> with C or whatever, the, the, blank, the, blank stares. And, and so I, you know, it worries me. I feel a bit like a kind of Churchillian voice in yeah, the wilderness in the are, 30s, clearly. warning about German disarmament. And so I do, I do have this kind of hope by appearing on, on your podcast that, that you know, people may, well, may listen. And, that, and we that, need, you know, in the future... Well, we need if, a if, network if, of military aviaries all across yeah. the country. If anyone exactly. from MI5 is listening to this, you know what you've got to do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. because cause it goes back to my point. You know, pigeons, you know, superheroes of history, you know, saved us from the kind of flood through the Second World War. But they may, you know, in the event of some awful cyber attack and you know a kind of solar storm taking out all our communications yeah. you know we may rely on those pigeons flying free in our skies you know once more and then people remember that you know perhaps it was this podcast that you know kind of turned the tide <sighs> well you know, if, if in any way we can play a humble role in saving britain <laughs> <laughs> that would be great um I, I mean gordon on on the topic of china i did see just when i was um doing some cursory research that in november 2020 a pigeon, a racing pigeon, sold for almost two million dollars in China. Mm -hmm. So they're obviously very, very pigeon friendly in China. Absolutely, and so pigeon, pigeon racing and pigeon breeding is still there, and actually stronger, perhaps in Asia. Still quite strong in the Middle East. Stronger in Asia. It's slightly. Well, they have it in in Delhi, don't they? Willie Dalrymple wrote uh, wonderful stuff about the uh, the pigeon races in. Indeed. Yeah, and if you go around the Middle East, you can still see quite a, a bit of it in, in in countries there. But yeah, I mean, you know, the the the, the breeding of those pigeons to 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 kind of a bit like racehorses to kind of breed the best pigeons, and this this you know this goes back to where we started. This kind of domesticated nature, the selective breeding, is partly what makes pigeons interesting. And it's why actually Darwin spends quite a bit of time in Origin of the Species talking about pigeons because of their ability to to selectively breed them, and he kind of draws this mm. analogy between artificial selection and natural selection. And so still the kind of breeding breeding the fastest pigeon or the best pigeon or breeding the most beautiful pigeon. You know, so there's always been this thing about pigeon fancying where you breed these kind of beautiful looking birds. And that was something in Roman times. And also um, still today, you will see these kind of ornate looking pigeons, which are being bred for their looks and which, again, are, are hugely valued. So, Gordon, we've we've looked at um, the kind of the cultural uses of the pigeon, the way that it's kind of in form mythology and so on. And we've looked at the uses that uh humans over the span of history have put pigeons to one final theme uh, or, which conveys kind of deeper truths about the relationship of humans to the animal kingdom is that um possibly the most shocking and notorious mass extinction featured a pigeon mm. specifically the passenger pigeon yeah so that's a terrible story what so, so just tell us a bit about that well i mean the passenger pigeons were I mean, they, they were slightly different from our, our um, um, Columbia, Livia, our, our, our homing pigeon, but they lived in, in huge colonies. Um, in the billions, just see, they? I mean, yeah, literally in the, billions. In the, in the billions. And I mean, people would say, I mean, particularly in, in, in North America, and they moved in these huge um, flocks. And people would say it would, it would sound like Niagara Falls, you know, when they moved, you know, and, and, and you'd almost feel the earth shake because they were, they, were, they were so enormous. Could I just read from uh, John James Audubon, who, you know, the great ornithologist, American ornithologist, writing in 1813, 
and he describes um, standing underneath the, uh, the uh, passenger pigeons going past. The air was literally filled with pigeons. The light of noonday was obscured as by an eclipse. The dung fell in spots, not unlike melting flakes of snow, and the continued buzz of wings had a tendency to lull my senses to repose. And he talks about um, the pigeons were still passing in undiminished numbers and continued to do so for three days in succession. I mean, it's kind of absolutely stunning spectacle. The yeah. sun blocked out for three days at a time by these passing flocks of pigeons. Yeah, and, and their breeding grounds kind of covered hundreds of square miles. But but basically, they got get, they get shot for for sport, particularly. In, and in this America. is the same time as the buffalo being wiped out. So it's kind yeah. of eighteen seventy to eighteen yep, ninety. By, by they're gone by, I think the First World War certainly. Um, but around the turn of the century, you know, billions are, are, are just killed like that, and they're gone like the dodo. Yeah, I was about yeah. to say the dodo. So the dodo is a distant relative of the pigeon, isn't it? Is that right? Yeah. Yes, yes. So a distant it's a, it's cousin, I think. A distant, yeah. Distant cousin, I mean. And, um, I mean, obviously pigeons themselves, as in the, what we recognise to be pigeons, I mean, the issue that a lot of people have with pigeons is not that there are too few, but there are too many. So Ken mm. Livingstone was a notorious mm. pigeon of yeah, Rats with wings. Rats with mm. wings. So just on the rats with wings issue, that is that a gross calumny? Gordon on pigeons because there is I mean a lot of listeners to this will say you know I've seen them scavenging in Trafalgar Square pigeons are very bad fellows Uh, do you think pigeons have been maligned oh I absolutely think they're maligned and you know they are they you know they have this reputation of somehow being you know it's interesting isn't it because in in ancient times you were hearing they were seen as kind of chaste and beautiful and now gods yeah symbols of the gods and now we see them as the kind of dirty things you know in in Trafalgar Square and we've you know that people have been trying to get rid of them and I think um it's a tragedy because you know these are our friends who are who are there because you know we've they've come with us into the cities as we built these cities um you know these these pigeons which most of the the feral pigeons you see in the cities are actually well are the descendants of the ones we raised in the dovecots and 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 the domesticated pigeons and who've come with us in the cities and who have you know as I said, saved us on many occasions. And yet we kind of, you know, we, we look down on them now. And so I do think, I do, I do, I do feel for, for, for pigeons and I feel like they, they get a Gordon, bad rap. That has been incredibly so moving. throughout so moving. the entire... Gordon, can I ask you one last question? Do you have a favourite cinematic pigeon? Oh, there's a few good ones, aren't there? I mean, what was yeah. that? Uh, there, were, there, there, there was that great cartoon. Is it Valiant? Is that the one I'm thinking of? I can't remember now, but there's a... Uh, I don't have a particular favourite. Do you, Dominic? I do. Yeah, I ask because I do, so I can finally con- contribute something meaningful to the this pigeon-based discussion. So, um, in Moonraker, oh. when um, James Bond's gondola comes out into um, St Mark's Square and transforms into a kind of car, and people are sort of machine gunning him from behind, and he he goes across St Mark's Square in this in this gondola, uh, a pigeon does a double take. <laughs> um it's very yes. it's a very yes i remember that yeah it's a very it's a very humorous moment for those people who may be listening with some um, and there was also uh catch the pigeon wasn't there where dick dastardly and muttley dick dastardly, um, yes yes chase the pigeon in uh in their flying machines yeah. yeah well gordon it's been it's been an absolute treat uh, absolutely worth the the, the it's way been an education uh, hasn't it tom it's been a genuine it really education has. it really has well it really for me has. anyway and maybe not for you you're already at you were already converted pigeon but... a file yeah <laughs> Well, um, I hope so, I made my case. So thank you. You did. You made your case. Yeah. Made it and you, brilliantly. And, uh, and so you, you may have saved Britain as well. Well, that's if you can close that pigeon gap, you will have performed mm. a miraculous patriotic service. So the book is Operation Columba. That's right, isn't it? Yeah, the um, secret pigeon service is the other. The secret title. pigeon service and tons of stories of pigeon-based daring do. Uh, <laughs> leaves the reader in absolutely no doubt that um, it was the pigeon that won the Second World War uh, and saved Europe from from Nazism. So hurrah for the pigeons uh, and hurrah for you, Gordon, for coming on the the show and um, and braving the scepticism of some of, of some people. Uh, some of don't them know who they were. Don't know who they were. But <laughs> um, thank you. So next week, uh, the rest is history. We'll have an episode on crows and an episode on the (laughs) starling. So much to come. (laughs) Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. Goodbye.